Carlos Ayala, CEO of GIA, Growing in Lot Achievement. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to you all on, uh, on this day and to talk about education. How do I inform you I want slides changed? Let's go ahead to the next slide, please. So Growing Inland Achievement is an organization that was founded by, by Tomas uh, and Judy and others in the region to, to transform this place. And really, to tap into what Judy was talking about, it's about improving the quality of life. Next slide, please. This is our vision, um, is to be able to bring people to work together and find ways to be able to move folks forward in their, in their aspirations of using education as a tool to improve people's qualities of life. And it's about bringing people together and not worrying about who's in front and who's behind, but actually locking arms with each other and stepping forward. And, and when I hear comments about the great work that GIA is doing, I think, well, that, that's great, but it's actually the region that's doing this work. We are not, GIA is a small organization. We bring people together and help connect folks and help them move forward. Our goal is not to put GIA at the top of this pedestal. It is to find ways to work with all of the 56 school districts and the 1.25 million K-12 through community college and four-year university students in the region to improve quality of life through education. That's how we are going to do it, is by improving those metrics. Next slide, please. How do we do this? Well, I, I could spend my entire time talking about the different uh, components of the work that we do. The key component is, is that we'll bring stakeholders together and we will have them create some ideas and we will help them carry out those ideas. So Project Impact that Dean Domachuku talked about at the beginning, he, that idea, we, we, we ran with that idea and we brought together both counties, offices of education to work on that project. We're gonna reach out to UCR to bring uh, UCR into this project to create a regional uh, plan for increasing the number of minority and black male students um, in, in the Inland Empire and find ways to be able to do it and guarantee him positions. Um, we also bring in money. Uh, yesterday I announced to my board, so it's still top secret, but uh, we received uh, about uh, $350,000 from the Kresge Foundation to support College Promise work. So thank you for all our partners for that hard work. We also received money from the um, ECMC Foundation, uh, $350,000 as well, uh, to be able to implement what we call the Student Voice Project that I'm gonna mention a little bit at the end. Um, so we're very excited about those, those opportunities that are presenting themselves, and there are many, many others that I can talk about. The one last thing I wanna talk about in terms of our mission is that we create these groups that are called Action Network Teams. I call them ANTS for short. I imagine a whole anthill throughout the entire Inland Empire where everyone in these, in these ants are coming together and they are carrying out activities to move forward. We are launching a, a FAFSA completion initiative. Uh, Judy mentioned it earlier. Uh, our board set a goal of 90% completion. We know that's achievable. We heard what Mike in Valverde has been able to do at his, in his school district. So our goal is to spread that out. There are districts that have FAFSA completion rates in the 50s. And we are gonna work with these, with these school districts to find out ways to be able to raise those things up. So I invite you to participate in the Action Network teams. You can go to our website, inlandempire.org, and you can find out more about those. We meet on, with a regular cadence, and there's lots of very exciting things happening in that space. But I'm not here to talk about GIA. I'm here to talk about the state of education in the Inland Empire. Next slide, please. Oh. It's kind of hard to see in this slide um, the way that it's broken down, but I just want to talk two big ideas out of this place, right? 
there is a there is a very large population of people in the Inland Empire who are adults without a college degree. And and what we need to find out is that we need to be able to disaggregate the data, look at where this, the affordances and constraints are of these students uh, to be able to uh, identify the best ways that we can that we can support the students. Um, I'm not going to go into details. That I have this presentation as a PDF available for you on our website, so you can go break down that data. Um, there's a really big piece of the pie, the green slice, that is students with some college and no degree. So while the K-12 school districts are very good at getting some students into college, there are restraints or there are constraints of students that don't allow them to finish. And, and it's really a big issue here in the Inland Empire. Um, next slide, please. If you look at educational attainment um, across the largest metropolitan school, uh, metropolitan statistical areas in the United States, you can see that uh, uh, Riverside and, and uh, San Bernardino counties, the, uh, that Ontario region, this does not include the desert, which I think would lower our scores, but the, this is the main urban area of the, of the IE. Um, we're ranked 13th in population, and we have a, a, a graduation rate of about 29% um, in, in that space. And that's of the top 13, we are the lowest. Next slide, please. If you look at all of the areas um, with a population of over 1 million people, we are the lowest of educational attainment of that whole group. Right, and there are many school districts, many, many uh, metropolitan areas that are, are notable. Detroit is in there, Oklahoma City is in there, Houston's in there. There are lots of other places in the, in the, in, in the nation that are, are above us in terms of educational attainment. So we have a lot of work to do here in the IE. And I have really good news, we're actually making lots of progress on that. And that's what my series of slides and presentations is about today, is about talking about that progress. How do we accelerate that progress is the question. Um, and we've heard about some of the projects going on, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, towards the end. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we do as a collective impact organization is that we come together and we decide what's important to look at. Judy asked us to pay attention to metrics. So we have both long-term metrics and short-term metrics, leading indicators, right? So our, our long-term metrics are these. And, um, and I'm gonna go through them and talk about them a little bit. I'm gonna give you the results for um, the white population in, in the Inland Empire, for the black population in the Inla, in, Inland Empire, and for Hispanic population. So you can see the progress that we're making in these spaces. And I, we're looking at this collection of targets um, because we believe these are the best indicators that are going to help us improve the quality of life as we begin to, to, to push our numbers up. Remember, we're, 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 in, we're in a place in, across the nation where, where we have work we need to do. And you're doing fantastic work, and you'll see that in a second. Next slide, please. So let's start with kindergarten readiness. Um, I'm arguing for, with my team to start talking about even earlier indicators, and there's an initiative about that that's very exciting that I'll talk about it at the end. Um, but if we look at uh, the indicators for... Uh, uh, the, the, the kindergarten readiness, what, what do you see there? Someone yell out what they see. Blue bars are what? Blue bars are 2016 and the red bars are 2019. So you can see that there's been an increase in kindergarten readiness over time. Right, so we're making great progress, but you can see that the two sets of bars for our Hispanic and black students remains lower, right? And ideally we're in a place where all these bars are equal and we cannot distinguish a kindergarten readiness by, by someone's ethnicity or their cultural backgrounds, right? But you can see that we're making progress and this is key because this progress will later translate into, in, into future progress. Next slide, please. 
So, okay, so this is third grade reading. Why third grade reading? Third grade reading is really important. The Annie Casey Foundation in the 1960s identified this as one of the key indicators to, f to fight the war on poverty. Um, and we, we've all uh, accepted that. Um, and, and so you can see our third grade reading uh, continues to improve. That slope is upward. Um, but you can see that the equity gaps um, in both counties remain the same. Both charts are two different counties. Um, and you can see that the, 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 the gap for our Hispanic and, and black students is, is far below that of our, of our students. So how do we take the opportunities that we have now because of the pandemic, because of the changes we've made in education, how do we create an equity focus to help us move forward? Kindergarten readiness, see improvement, still see the gap. Third grade reading, we see improvement, we still see the gap. Next slide, please. Eighth grade mathematics, big predictor for future success as well. And you can see again, the line is not as steep as it is for English or for reading. Um, and you can see that there, there continues to be the equity gap between our black and Latino students and those that are our, our white students in this space. Ideally, I'm, I'm, I'm a former teacher, taught math and science. Uh, if we could support increased numeracy, I believe, in fourth and fifth grade, it could be transformational. Because as a teacher in Calexico, California, teaching math, the moment I started talking about fractions, it was like, ah, everybody loses it, right? <laughs> but the, it's so much fun, and kids know fractions, right? They actually do. If you took a Snickers bar and cut it in half, they'll tell you if it's equal or not. They, they can do that sort of work, right? So I, you'll see more about the mathematics. You'll hear more about the mathematics over the next few years. But we have some great uh, uh, things moving forward. We're making some progress in math, um, but the equity gaps remain. And so how do, we, how do we begin working on those? Next slide, please. Okay, this is high school graduation. Now, um, Judy talked a little bit about this. Kudos to uh, Riverside County for their great successes in, in uh, their uh, graduating students from high school. Did you know that you can graduate from a high school in, in the state of California and not be ready for college? Yes, and our numbers indicate that. Um, the, you know, the, the very tall bars are, are the, the different years uh, for our different uh, ethnic backgrounds um, and looking at the, the college, uh, um, the, the graduation rate from high school. So they get a, they get a graduation diploma. Um, and the, the smaller bars are the bars that represent A through, uh, a through G completion. So we see a gradual increase, so we're moving in the right direction. Um, we don't, w the equity gap remains. We need to figure out ways to close that e equity gap, find initiatives to be able to do that. Um, and then we need to have, we need to start having the conversation, why are only half of our high school graduates moving on uh, or completing A through G and are ready to go to college, right? Many school districts are considering A through G as a graduation requirement, um, and it is a possibility to do that, and there are, there are, uh, there could be initiatives if the community wishes to do that, to push that idea forward, that all programs are A through G. So we can't ask, we can't make the statement that you can graduate from high school in the IE and not be ready for college, right? Next slide, please. So the other big piece of news here that I think is, is really important is, is to talk about those students who do finish and are moving on into uh, uh, post-secondary. Uh, so when a student is, uh, graduates from high school, we can see that we have, we've had a gradual increase in the number of students who are going into college. We do see that equity gap. Uh, the blue bar is our, I can't, is it? Is it our black students and our, our the, the red bar is our Hispanic students, you can see that there is a, there's a large equity gap there and the gap between the black and the white is smaller. Um, that's a really interesting finding. It's a really interesting thing to look at. You also notice that there's a slight decrease in the number of students going into post-secondary education. Um, this is both either a college, community college, a four-year university, or some sort of certificate program. So this is comprehensive, right? And then 
uh, we, are see we are seeing a trend throughout the nation that people are turning away from post-secondary uh, credentials and colleges and diplomas, um, and they're, they're trying to find some other way moving forward. And there's a flurry, a flurry of activity happening um, by businesses, um, uh, uh, nonprofits, other organizations to create their own kind of certificate programs, their own kind of programs, because they feel that the current set of post-secondary options doesn't satisfy the needs of, of, of their employees and of their students. So you hear lots of chatter about that. And so Amazon has a big program. And I was, uh, I was on a, a call with uh, uh, several local employers, and they're all talking about doing something like this too to teach them leadership skills or, or communication skills. They're, try, they're trying to find ways to better align education. This is an indicator of that, but notice we still have our equity gap. We need to figure out how we can do that. And remember, we're about 65% Hispanic students in the IE, so you can see that, that that red bar right there in terms of number of students is huge compared to the other, the other two uh, uh, numbers combined together. So this is something to watch for. Next, next slide, please. So this is, this is completion. And I just want you to take a moment to look at that. And I'd like you to explain to a person sitting next to you one finding that you have there. Okay, explainers. Can someone tell me something they see on that chart that, that, that they find that, like, wow, that's interesting? Raise your hand if you have something. Yeah. Educational attainment, educational attainment less than high school, 33% uh, for Hispanics. Can you repeat that? Uh, yes. Educational attainment less than high school or GED. Uh, is 33% for the Hispanic community. Uh, in comparison to 10% for blacks and 7% uh, for white. Yeah, so thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very important finding. Um, and, and so this is, this, is a, this is a question to ask. If, you, if we were to go back and look at the other slides, we saw graduation rates in the 90s, okay? Um, and when, when we go out and we ask the community, when we go out door to door, and uh, we, we collect information, it's the American Community Survey is what the tool is. Um, they go out and they collect information yearly uh, from, from the region. We find out that 33% of our adult Hispanics in the region do not have a high school degree, okay? So this is, there's a lot of questions there. All right, and so as a collective impact organization, when we discovered this number, and everyone's talking about this number now, actually across the state, it's even larger than here. That um, you know we are we're launching an initiative to explore that and try to disaggregate that and find out more about what's that. I'm sure that many of you have hi your hypotheses about why that is. Um, but we want to we want to uncover that because we want to be able to think about how best can we begin to serve those students because if we want to change the quality of life in the area, this is a population that should be a high priority for us. Um, the other thing is that we need to raise the graduation rates higher across the region. I have a question over here. Um, I, I don't have that data at hand, but it's easily accessible. Um, and if you were to forward me some questions, I'd be glad to present at next year's conference the, the answer to that question. Okay? Um, th this data is publicly available. It's through the American Community Survey. You can actually download it by county. You can get down into zip codes. Um, and so we'll be able to do it by district um, or by zip codes and then by district community college districts too, uh, to be able to, to, to look at that number. Um, another question. Yeah. 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 I'm in 
special education? Does this data include all kids, or is it just for kids accessing general education? This, this data is for adults 24 okay. and older. Okay. Okay. We don't, we don't know if they, at what time they were a special education okay. student or not. We don't know that. Okay. Thank you. Um, but because of questions like that, we have different initiatives in place that are allowing us to capitalize on this information and, and be able to move this and be able to answer questions like that. And I'll just talk a little bit about that at the end. I'll take one more question. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, so th the other thing is that we really need to push post-secondary educational attainment because we know there's a relationship between getting a, um, having a post-secondary degree or credential and in, in increased employment. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And here it is broken down by ethnicity. Did you have a question? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. In the previous slides, you have the highest number of Hispanics adults not achieving high school. Do you have any information about the language speaking as a primary language? Um, I, I, I don't, I, we would have that information. Um, so I, I appreciate your question, send that question to me. Okay. And then I will include it in the report that I prepare for next year for this. And if we've uncovered those findings before, I'll send out a, we, we have these little bits of information we call insights that we send out in a newsletter and we, we, we come up with questions like that. So I don't know, I presume that the mother language is probably is Spanish, okay. um, but that's just my hypothesis. I'm trying to, trying to dive into it. That's, Great questions. That, that's what Great I wanted questions. to. Great Thank questions. You. Okay, uh, you can see that, that we, as this is, you have a degree, this is the amount of money you're making it's not racially equal. That's an interesting question. Why is that? Why is that? And there are, there are, there are multiple explanations for that, the kinds of courses and programs that, that uh, students choose in college as they, as they uh, progress through the college. They may not be choosing the, the kinds of courses that will lead to a career that's a higher paying career. Um, and that, that explains in part that. Um, it, we have an initiative in, in play right now where we're, we're trying to understand um, a, a, a program that the colleges, the community colleges do uh, using uh, liberal studies or interdisciplinary studies as a tool to help graduate students. That may not lead to, to good career opportunities for students. And we, we need to think about how we can, we can work on those uh, on answering more questions about that specific piece. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a compilation of all those slides. I figured I'd unpack it a little bit for you. Uh, again, you can, you can have this available. It's on our website. You can download it and look at it. Uh, we have it broken down by all of the, the different areas. The, the bottom line for our educational data is that we are seeing improvements over time from kindergarten through high school. Our post-secondary rates are not where they need to be, the completion rates. We need to figure out ways to do that. And there are so many initiatives. Um, uh, Dr. Morales, President Morales, is receiving an award from the Campaign for College Opportunity today for the great work that Cal State San Bernardino is doing with, their tr with transfer students. So it's initiatives like that that are going to be begin changing these numbers and improve those specific numbers. I have one more data slide to show you. Next slide, please. So during the pandemic, um, uh, the first year, second year, fifth year of the pandemic, I lost track. Um, but this was early on in the pandemic. We started collecting data from our, our partners in our county offices. I wanna say that the, the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools, uh, their offices there and the Riverside County Office of Education are great partners with GIA. We have multiple initiatives in place. I could spend 20 minutes talking about them. Um, 
They also helped us look at the data across counties about the numbers of Fs and Ds students were receiving during the pandemic. This is, this is prior to the end of the semester. So when I have the end of semester uh, scores, I'll be able to show you this. But you can see that students were severely impacted during the pandemic when we made the shift to online learning. And this is gonna have significant consequences for the Inland Empire, especially our post-secondary uh, attainment rates. And I know that many uh, universities and colleges are finding ways to, to better improve how they, they, they serve students. Uh, but this is something that we need to keep an eye on, right? The graduating class of 20, the graduating class of 21, and the graduating class of 22 are severely impacted by the, the, the COVID situation. Um, but to your question about special ed and, and students with, with other kinds of special needs, I actually, unfortunately, I just took the slide out prior to the presentation um, that has this broken down by that as well. Um, and they, special education 504 students, foster youth, were the most significantly impacted by this. Um, and when you combine that with other classifications, uh, um, they, are, they, they are the ones that are most uh, severely um, impacted. Last slide, please. There's a lot of hope, lots of hope. Right now, there's a group of folks meeting with regular cadence and with actual success in hand on on coming together to address child care issues in the Inland Empire, okay? It's amazing, right? We, I've, been, I've been attending these meetings, I've been hearing about them, and we heard about a supervisor in one of the county offices starting to use the language that that group put out there to start pushing the issue moving forward. And I'm so happy that we're doing this because as a former colleague of, uh, of Dean Domachuku, I was a school of education dean and I launched an early childhood studies program because I know it's the most important place to start. And so we're seeing great progress on that. So if you want to find out more about that, contact me and then I'll connect you with the people that are doing all this fantastic work. The second thing I want to talk about is the great work that our K-12 our K-12 districts are doing right now. And one of the things that really, really is shining right now is how they are listening to students and they're finding ways to scaffold students. We had a we have this thing called Building Better from Disruption. It's a it's a podcast. Go to our website, you can see it there. And one of the, uh, the assistant superintendents up in Napa Valley talked about how they opened up the door to the idea of listening to students, you know, actually having conversations. What's going on with you? What is going on? And they were really, really worried at the beginning that they were going to hear things that they didn't want to hear, that they were going to they, they were going to present obstacles that were just going to be insurmountable. But something he said at the Impetus of Pat, uh, what he said at the end of the presentation, he goes, you know, we had a lot of concerns, but it's always a net positive to listen to your students, always. So even though you're going to hear things that you don't want to hear, it's always important to listen to them because they are going to tell you some things that you do not know. We heard also on that, on that podcast from um, an assistant superintendent in Valverde and how they have been listening to students as well. And some of their, their high school students talked about they wanted to be able to access a mental health professional without going through an adult. Oh my God, imagine that, right? High school students asking for that. So they implemented. It was scary, they implemented it. And they're actually seeing successes associated with this. This idea of elevating student voice continues into the community colleges and the four-year universities. We launched an initiative we call the Student Voice Initiative where we went out and we used an asynchronous qualitative focus group 
uh, technique, and we identify specific students that we want to talk to, they tell us the kinds of challenges that we're having, and then we feed that information back to the campuses, and they begin to make adjustments. The, the campuses that are, that are participating in this work are seeing improvements in enrollment, they're seeing improvements in, in their students' persistence, uh, which are really big right now, especially for the community colleges, um, this, this work around student voice. So there's a lot of positive things happening, and there's many more that I can talk about, and I'm sorry if I didn't mention your program, um, but the, there, there's a lot of hope, and, and I ask you to please Join all of us who are part of this network that GIA is, 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 is connected with because all of you are working really hard and we need to elevate the great work that you're doing. Thank you very much for your time today.